I've not seen my grandma since 2009. She had a catastrophic argument with my dad, but he used to be elusive about what actually transpired between them. And grandma moved away a few months later. I only know that because I remember cycling past her house and seeing it for sale. I was always certain she told my dad her new address, but he always refused my request to visit her. Once I did a little detective work and opened a letter addressed to my dad, I recognized grandma's handwriting from birthday cards that I had received over the years. Dad scolded me for rummaging through his post, of course. He got all of his mail delivered to a separate P.O. box after that, stopping me from intercepting any more letters. And dear John, please forgive me. Mom. That was all that it said. Unfortunately, there was no return address. Anyway, when my mom died in 2018, grieving became our sole focus. I stopped asking about my grandma. I didn't even really think about her for a long time, just my mom. She had been struggling with her mental health for a few years and she was missing for a few months before they found her body. I don't really want to talk anymore about that. I just thought that I would give some context before carrying on. It's been a painful few years. I haven't asked dad about grandma since I was a teenager, and I'm 24 now. To be honest, I decided a while ago that I was happy to move on with my life. It felt a little like the ship might have sailed. Dad's the only family that I have left. I don't want to irreparably ruin our relationship by persistently badgering him about his mother. But last night, something unexpected had happened. Kara? Dad shouted from the living room. Come in here and sit down with me for a minute. And gulping, I tentatively entered the room and chose an armchair opposite the sofa on which he was slouched. I was panicking because I thought it might be time for a talk about me still living at home. I had finished university a couple of years ago, and I've got a job in sales, but it doesn't pay nearly well enough for me to move out. You okay, Dad? I asked. He sighed. Yeah, I'm fine, but I've been thinking lately. Uh-oh, I teased hoping a classic dad joke might relieve some tension. It didn't. You've not asked me about grandma for years, he said after a long pause. I was flabbergasted. Dad has never been the one to bring up grandma, not since their unexplained estrangement, so I hardly knew how to respond. After several awkward seconds, I realized that I was simply sitting there mouth agape, staring silently. My father adjusted his reading glasses, which were perched precariously atop his seemingly clammy nose, and forever slipping down. I started to wonder why he looked so sweaty and anxious. Could this finally be it? I wondered. I'm coming to terms with things. For instance, you're not my baby girl anymore. You're old enough to go out and make your own decisions, he said. And I often find myself wondering whether you still want to see your grandma. I shrugged. I stopped asking about her because I could see how much it upset you. Dad smiled weakly. I know we've been through a lot. But what I'm saying is that I'm aware of your age. You're an adult now. I just I worry sometimes that she might try to contact you. Maybe she already has. I shook my head. She hasn't. Dad seemed to ease up a little bit at hearing that. Good, that's good. But I realize that if I really want to keep you safe, I have to tell you why you shouldn't see your grandma if she contacts you. I nodded. It would help to know why you two fell out. Suddenly, it was Dad's turn to gulp. He shifted his body weight in his seat, stalling for time. I found my eyes wandering to the night sky outside our living room window. Torrential rain pummeled the tarmac of our sleepy road, 
and a solitary lamppost was scarcely visible through the cascading curtain of droplets on the glass. Your grandma and granddad always had a strange relationship. Dad eventually started. That's why I have so many issues, I think. I just hope that none of that rubbed off on you. My mom and dad were always good to me, but they weren't good to each other. And they seemed oblivious to the effect that they had on me as a child. I nodded gently. I could remember grandma and granddad bickering throughout my early childhood. And then one day, my granddad left her. I always thought mom was a bit too harsh on dad for his long business trips. He was just trying to provide for us. But when he left her, I obviously emphasized and took her side. So I don't want you thinking of me as the bad guy, dad said. I shook my head. Never. I'm dancing around the subject. You only have one question, I imagine. Dad said, What changed? Dad, you don't have to tell, I started. But I do, he interrupted. If you stop me now, I might never summon the courage again. Okay, I found something shortly after your granddad left Kara. I was cleaning out your grandma's attic and there was a cardboard box labeled The Catalog. It was, it was full of photos. Photos of missing people I later learned. And every person's story was the same. These candid photographs were taken from a distance. In parks and busy shopping centers. Men and women. That wasn't what scared me. It was the photographs taken in the attic. They were unimaginable. I, I can't say any more than that. Quaking at a revelation I never expected to leave my father's lips, I sat in silence processing the horrifying information. My mental cogs were turning, but I hadn't yet realized what I was still repressing. Anyway, when I confronted your grandma about it, she burst into tears, Dad croaked. She said it was the reason that Granddad left. He had discovered her secret. Obviously, I told her that I was going straight to the police and she just... She said she understood. She didn't try to stop me, but she fled that very night. Fourteen years later, there's still no sign of her. I just hope that wherever she went, she stopped taking people. And that was it. My dad's terrible story. I couldn't find any suitable words, so I stopped searching for any. We both sat for a prolonged period of silence, watching the rain continue to beat down on the world outside, a world which suddenly looked a little darker to me. Eventually, I went to bed, but I didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. My head was worrying, but not for the reasons that one might expect. You see, Dad's story didn't fully add up. I had remembered something. I used to stay at my grandparents' house from time to time and they would often let me bring a friend or two, given that I was an only child, and they didn't want me to endure a boring sleepover with two oldies. They knew who I would invite. It was always the same two girls, Sophie and Francesca. In fact, they often insisted on me inviting my best friends, and my friends loved my grandparents. Well, mainly they loved the sweets that grandma and granddad would give us before bed, plying us with succulent, sugary goodness that should have kept us awake all night. And yet we always slept like babies. Well, not every time. One night when I was around six or seven, I awoke in the early hours of the morning. It was still dark outside and I felt unbelievably groggy as if somebody had wrapped an elastic band around my brain and restricted the blood flow. But after a few seconds, I became aware of my surroundings and noticed that, while Francesca was fast asleep, Sophie's sleeping bag was empty, and the door to my bedroom, my dad's old room, was wide open. I eyeballed the pitch black upstairs landing through the doorway, my eyesight was hazy and I'm sure that I wouldn't have been able to see a thing anyway, 
but my ears, on the other hand, were working perfectly. That must have been what woke me up. The sound of creaking floorboards above my head, from the attic. My immediate thought was that Sophie was messing around up there and I worried that I was about to be in big trouble with my grandparents. And so I gingerly rose to my feet, almost passing out as I did and tiptoed quietly out of my bedroom, trying to navigate the blackened landing. I didn't want to turn on any lights and wake grandma or granddad up. But the creaking attic floorboards persisted, along with a muffled voice and I knew it was only a matter of time before my grandparents woke up anyway. Sophie, I hissed, hoping that she would hear me and my grandparents wouldn't. The abnormally loud creaking immediately subsided, and I held my breath as I finally accepted something. Those can't be Sophie's footsteps. I hurriedly crept back to bed as the floorboards like wooden piano keys creaked hurriedly across the length of the ceiling. I managed to slide under my duvet cover and close my eyes as the attic door opened with a giant groaning noise. It was followed by somebody very heavily clamoring down the ladder. I remember striving feverishly to feign that I was asleep as the unknown figure lumbered across the landing. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying not to cry as I listened to the strained breathing of the figure who had stopped in the doorway. The figure who was clearly watching me. I didn't need to open my eyes to know that it wasn't Sophie. It was the boogeyman. That was what I told myself. The monster padded clumsily into the room, dropped something heavy on the floor, and then walked over to my bed. I still remember that stale, unclean breath on my face. I was trembling beneath the duvet, but I held my nerve and prayed the creature wouldn't eat me. And eventually it slowly backed out of the room, closing the bedroom door. I remember when I was eventually certain that the monster had left, opening my eyes to see Sophie lying atop her sleeping bag, still passed out. She must have been unaware of what had happened to her in the attic. I sure hope so. I know now, of course, what I was too young to know then. There was something wrong with those Swedes. Just like there was something wrong with Grandma and Granddad, insisting on me inviting Sophie and Francesca. But I also remember something else. Something that unravels part of my dad's story. It wasn't both grandparents who invited my friends and gave us sweets. It was Granddad. This morning, I returned to my old ways of badgering Dad. You have to know more, I said. Grandma could still be hurting people. My dad scowled. Kara, please, she'd be a very old woman by now. Even if the police never find her, she'll be gone from this world eventually. You're safe, I'm safe, let's just move on. I thought you would stop asking questions if I were to finally tell you the whole story. But it's not the whole story, I thought. You must have read some of the letters that she sent. Maybe she left clues, I said. I read all of them and I took them straight to the police. She hasn't written to me in about five years, so just drop it, Dad pleaded. I'm, I'm sorry, Dad, but I can't get it out of my head. I keep thinking of those poor people, how they suffered. And this is coming from me. I didn't even see the photos. I don't know what things he, she did. It must be far worse for you. You must want to do something. Nice guilt tripping, Dad said. Yes, I want to do something. That's exactly why I've been helping the police for years. I'm not protecting her. She may be my mother, but... What she did to those people... Yeah, you're right. You have no idea. And I wouldn't want you to know. No human could do those things. Sorry, I sighed. That was a cruel move. I just feel horrible knowing that she's out there. And like you said, I'm an adult. I make my own decisions. So I want to know that I'm not going to let this lie. I'm going to look for her. I expected Dad to shout at me, but he didn't. He sat thoughtfully at the kitchen table, 
twiddling his spoon in his cereal, and I waited patiently for a response. Yet again, he surprised me. I'll tell you something, he finally said. I perked up, leaning across the table inquisitively. The lead detective would check on us often, Dad continued. He kept me updated on the investigation, and he told me about the immediate connection he drew after they finally poured through the thousands of photos. 36 victims, every single one of them was brunette. Could have been a wild coincidence, but the lead detective didn't think so. Serial killers often have a pattern. I instantly shuddered. Another horrifying memory emerged from the fractured recesses of my mind. A memory that, yet again, I didn't have the stomach to share with my father. Around the age of eight, I distinctly remember waking from a sleepover at my grandparents' house to find a chunk of my hair, my brunette hair, missing. It had been sloppily chopped from the left side of my head during the night. I remember blaming Francesca as she was the main prankster out of the three of us, but she blamed Sophie. Neither of them ever owned up to it, and I got in big trouble with my parents for that one. I really hope Dad doesn't remember that, or he'd probably put two and two together. Fortunately, his memory is abysmal. Oh, and of course, my granddad's insistence that Sophie and Francesca attend sleepovers it makes so much more sense now. They were both brunette too. I had a blonde friend called Lucy who would come over to play from time to time, but the sleepover invitation was never extended to her. It all makes me feel a little bit sick. I doubt that helps with your investigation, Dad said. But then, we're not police officers, are we, Pat? Best to leave it to the professionals. And you're not going to tell me about anything you read in the letters, I asked. She never gave me any details as to her whereabouts, Kara, Dad sighed. She didn't want to be found. Well, then what did she write, I asked. Dad shrugged. Uh, nothing that was ever of much use to the police, in all fairness. But I gave them the letters anyway. She endlessly requested forgiveness. And she asked questions about, well, about you, of course. About your mom, too. It made me angry when she asked about the two of you. Maybe she was worried about our safety. I absentmindedly replied, without thinking about the words that had left my mouth. Dad raised an eyebrow at me. Kara, I know she was your grandma and you loved her, but she wasn't the kind of woman you remember. That was a lie, a facade she had maintained for decades. It's taken me many years to come to terms with that, so I understand that it might take time for you too. I just don't want you to live in denial. I nodded my head, dejected at the prospect of never having any closure. But then my dad, as he always does, dropped the biggest bombshell as an afterthought. I suppose, well, in one letter she did write something that reminded me of my childhood. Love you, my North Angel. I miss our happy times. She used to call me that whenever we visited Gateshead. And I think we all went as a family, didn't we? Dad asked. I nodded. I remembered Grandma calling me the exact same thing. Anyway, the detective contacted police and Gates said, but nothing ever came of that lead. Dad said, shrugging. But the line was far more significant to me. Dad was forgetting something, so I excused myself and headed upstairs to the main bathroom. Sure enough, atop a forgotten shelf, there it still stood. The rather large angel of the north figurine that Grandma had bought while we were in Gates had. A souvenir to remember happy times. She said that to all of us, and those words were used again in the letter to Dad. It seemed a bizarre reference to make, but as I removed the figurine which had been untouched for more than a decade, I noticed a slip of paper stuck to the bottom of the ornament. It read, John, something is wrong. You should know that by the time you read this. If not, you might have stumbled upon it by accident. I suppose that would be better than it sitting unnoticed for years. 
Whatever the case, you need to tell the police that we're in Devon. Remember your dad's old caravan. That's where we'll be. He's leaving Lancaster soon and I'll follow when the time's right. It's the only way he'll spare them. I can't do anything else to protect you. He's always watching. I don't have time to write anymore. I've already spent too long in here. Heart racing, I immediately crumpled the piece of paper and shoved it in my pocket. I didn't want Dad to find out. But this is perhaps one of the most perturbing pieces of the puzzle. Granddad forced Grandma to take the blame. He threatened our safety. Even though the note dated back to 2009 and knew that I had to go to Devon, Grandma might be long gone as Granddad might. But I wasn't going to let this rest without finding out the truth for myself. And fortunately, I knew exactly where to find the caravan. That was another family holiday Dad's parents had repeated with me as a child. My dad was already at work and I called in sick to my job. I didn't tell my dad where I was going. I jumped into my car, set the destination, and drove for five long hours from Lancaster to Devon. When I arrived, it wasn't quite the picturesque place that I remembered. The UK had been bombarded with torrential showers over the past couple of days, and the sky was painted a murky, near colorless gray. The horizon was an endless expanse of nothingness, footed by rolling green hills. And, in the midst of a mostly neglected caravan park, there stood a rusty, forlorn, static home. And Granddad's caravan. Yes, it was still there. And as I clambered out of my car, I was suddenly overcome by all-encompassing terror. The realization of what I was doing had hit me. I wasn't telling stories with my dad in the comfort of our home. I wasn't reminiscing on near misses from my childhood. This was real. I was standing before the home of the boogeyman. My boots squelched in the sod and muddy footpath leading up to the caravan's front door. Rain beat mercilessly down on me, but I was glad of it. The deafening sound of the downpour was drowning out my footsteps. I had the element of surprise on my side. And when I reached the front door, I took several long measured breaths before finally knocking on it. To my surprise, it swung open. I knew I shouldn't step inside. The lightless layer of the beast terrified me more than any of my childhood sleepovers. I suppose the knowledge of his heinous crimes, crimes of a real-life man, made me fear him more than any imaginary monster. I bravely moved one foot in front of the other and crossed the threshold. Clearly nobody had stepped foot in that place for a few years at the very least. There were mold-covered plates in the kitchen sink, and I screamed as a rat scurried from a cupboard, disappearing somewhere into the blackness of the house. Grandma, I called. I don't know why I announced myself. I suppose that I had already accepted that nobody could possibly be living there. I should have just called the police like Grandma said I thought. But if I had done that, I would have forfeited my one chance of finding any sort of evidence. And so I pressed onward, flipping any light switch that I could find. Nothing. Probably the result of unpaid electricity bills. Another good sign that nobody lived there. Instead, I fumbled in my pocket for my phone, pulled it out and turned on the flashlight. I wish that I hadn't. The open plan living area comprising of a kitchen and sofa was an expansive room for a static home. It probably took up most of the caravan, 30 by 10 feet, humongous, and every inch of the walls, I mean every single inch, was coated in hair. A hundred thousand pieces of brunette hair. Most strands had a red tinge to them and the entire demonic decoration was knotted in a crisscrossed pattern, the interwoven pain of a nightmarish man's victims. Terrified and sickened beyond words, I bent over and hurled onto the floor, thankful at least to be eyeing something other than the horror which lined the walls. I quickly turned my flashlight to the corridor which led to the back of the static home. 
I had seen enough and the sooner that I could say that I had checked every inch of the caravan, the better. The bathroom was another moldy forgotten room, hairless thankfully, and so I moved towards the final room of the house, the bedroom. A room emanating a stench so powerful that I feared it more than the horror behind me. I didn't want to open the door, I really didn't, but I had to do it. And so, door handle in my sweaty palm, I lightly pushed forwards. Vomit bubbled to the top of my throat again, and I found myself eyeing another room lined with meticulously intertwined hair. Hair that covered not only the walls but the floor, and every inch of the bed, every inch of the room. But that wasn't what horrified me most. What horrified me was the hairy lump merging with the bedding. Grandma. A little more than bones, well, I can only assume that to be the case because she too was coated entirely in hair. And I'm only assuming it to be her because there was no way of identifying the body. I didn't have to get close to know that she was dead, and I didn't want to do so. She was interlaced with the room's hair blanket, which had spread like a fungus throughout the interior of the house. I can't decide whether it would have been better or worse to instead see the corpse beneath. I turned to run, but on my way out I noticed the wardrobe door was ever so slightly ajar. It beckoned me, though I knew great horrors lay within, but I had to do it. It was why I had traveled so far. And so stepping onto the soft, hair-blanketed floor, I walked towards the wardrobe and pushed the door fully open. I shrieked. The catalog. Those words were printed on a slim slip of paper which was attached to the inner door of the empty wooden wardrobe and a new collection of photos could be found glued to the back panel. Photos of me. My first day at university in Manchester back in 2017. Photos of me in clubs at restaurants. Even a photo of me sleeping in my dorm. He watched me sleep. I thought that I had an empty stomach, but I surprised myself, unleashing another horror-driven stream of bile across the floor but I collected myself and returned my gaze to the inside of the wardrobe. At least they're all photos of me, I thought. Maybe he hasn't taken any other victims. But they weren't all photos of me. On the inside of the other door, there was another collection of candid shots. Pictures of my mother. Update. I called the police, and I've also taken photos of the wardrobe with my phone's camera. Maybe something in those pictures could help me find Grandad. I just feel sorry for my dad. There's no hiding the truth from him now. Last night, my dad and I talked for hours about, well, everything. I'm not going to hide things from you anymore, I said, pulling up my phone. I took photos of the wardrobe. Dad calmly took my phone and started scrolling through the photos that I had taken. Oh God! Dad cried, pushing the phone back into my hands. Do you think, I started gulping, do you think that he's responsible for mom? Dad winced sharply. Kara, I, I don't want to, I don't know whether I can grieve for your mother twice. I understand why he'd prefer to believe that mom took her own life, rather than believe that somebody had took it from her. And perhaps I don't want the police to uncover the truth either. Perhaps I'm done grieving too. But what I will say is that mom's death in 2018, though seemingly self-inflicted, was unfathomably awful. A mangled corpse in a car rack. And I can't help but wonder why she would want to end her life so painfully. Anyway, I had the day off work, given the circumstances and I spent it flicking through my photos, searching for answers. I couldn't stop thinking about the photo of me sleeping in my university dorm room. He's always watching. That's what Grandma said in her note. Maybe he traveled to and from their Devon hideout at first, but he likely did never return after killing his wife and leaving her there. 
So where is he now? I wondered in horror, scrolling back and forth through my photos. There is a picture of mom driving on the motorway. A picture that granddad had taken while he was driving too. In it, I could see the dashboard of his car and his left hand on the steering wheel. With his wrist donning a shiny golden Rolex. But most importantly, he had captured his BMW's askew hood ornament. Distinctly askew. A sinking feeling consumed me. Dad, I said. My dad lifted his head from the newspaper. Yes? Is this the car you're always complaining about? I asked, showing him the photo. My dad's eyes widened as he slowly nodded at me, face turning a ghostly shade. For the past few years, he had been moaning on and off about spotting a BMW with that exact shabby ornament around our village. Parked in places that it shouldn't be parked, but it always moved before he could do anything about it. I think we need to call the police, he said. I nodded, feeling more than a little queasy. Dad couldn't remember when or where he had last seen the vehicle. As I said, my dad's memory is awful. But I was sure that it was only a month or so ago that he moaned about it, being parked in a double yellow line around the corner from our street. That meant that Granddad had been here for years. Am I one of his victims or not, I wondered, continuing to scroll through the photos while my dad talked to the police. Every photo of my mother and me had been taken at night. He used the flashlight on his phone or the headlights of his car to illuminate his surroundings. And that made me think of other unusual things from the past few years. For instance, I often forgot to draw my curtains before bed. Foolish, given that I'm a light sleeper. And since lockdown, I can think of numerous occasions on which I was rudely awakened in the early hours of the morning. A car's blinding full-beam headlights would fill my small room. Every time I would grumpily get up and draw my curtains. That wouldn't completely block out the light from the road. But the car, strangely, would always drive away shortly afterwards. As if there were no point in staying without being able to see through my window. Another unusual thing comes to mind when I think of that dreaded photo Granddad took in my dorm room. Could he have been watching me sleep back home? I'm a forgetful person, I think we've established that. But at least once a week, I've been waking in the morning to find my bedroom door ever so slightly ajar. And I'm fairly certain that I rarely forgot to close it. That terrifies me more than anything. The thought that he had been in our house, close enough to touch me. Thank you, officer, my dad said, hanging up the phone and turning to me. They're going to keep an eye out for the car that matches the description. As for the broader investigation into his location, they're looking into missing persons cases from recent years. The detective is going to come over here personally and talk to us about moving somewhere safer, somewhere that Granddad can't find us. Won't Granddad just follow us? I asked, trembling. Dad hugged me. I know you're scared, Kara, but it's going to be okay. The police have it under control. As we waited for a detective, Simon Smith, I'm not using his real name for obvious reasons. All I could think about was the fact that the police didn't seem to have anything under control. They had known of this horror for 14 years and they were no closer to solving anything. Anyway, I wasn't expecting a dingy brown Ford Focus to pull into our driveway. I suppose detectives in TV shows and films lead a more glamorous lifestyle. The man who had exited the car must have been in his early 30s, though his coarse skin aged him. He had a thinning, damaged hair but a neatly trimmed beard. He wore a smart, grey trench coat and black gloves. In that way, he seemed to conform to Hollywood stereotypes of the typical detective. Nice to see you, John, he said, shaking hands with my dad. Same to you, Simon, dad replied. What's it been now, four years? Simon nodded. About that, yes. I'm sorry it's been so long since I've had anything to tell you. The case was admittedly gathering dust until yesterday's discovery. And this is our hero, Kara, I presume. I nodded my head, shaking his hand.
I'm really sorry, Kara, Simon said somberly. What you saw in that house was something that nobody should ever have to see. But you are incredibly brave and undoubtedly smart. Perhaps a career in detective work is on the cards for you. I smiled weakly. Right, well, I think the first thing that we should do is find alternative accommodation for the two of you. How does that sound? Simon asked. But my granddad will just follow us, I protested. Oh, he won't, I assure you, Simon replied. I'll be checking my tail the whole way. How long will we have to stay away? My dad asked. What if you never find my father? Simon shook his head. We'll find him, John, don't you worry. You both have been a massive help with this investigation. We've already found a BMW matching your description on numerous recent CCTV tapes from business owners in town. I don't think it'll be long before he rears his ugly head. Realizing that arguing was futile, I went upstairs and packed a bag. And ten minutes later, with our most important belongings in hand, we walked with Detective Smith to his battered up Ford Focus. So where are you taking us? Dad asked as we clambered inside and buckled our seatbelts. A travel lodge in Manchester, Simon replied. With any luck, we'll have him before the end of the week. As we set off, I watched my quaint little village roll by the passenger side window. The sun was setting, but the sky was still a calming blue. A settled, a safe world surrounded me in contrast to the rainy, chaotic few days which had preceded it. So, how did you do it, Kara? Simon asked. I looked away from the window. What? How did you figure out where to find your granddad? He asked. I shrugged, nervously locking eyes with Simon in the rearview mirror. Grandma left clues. Simon chuckled, parodying what I had said. Grandma left clues. Remarkable. I'm serious. You should really join the force. You're a sight better at this than me. It was as the car turned sharply onto a country road that I first noticed it. The sleeve of Simon's trench coat lifted as he steered to the left, and it revealed a something beneath his black glove. A golden Rolex. My stomach immediately lurched. Won't this way take us longer, Simon? We should have turned right to head towards Manchester, my dad pointed out. Simon didn't reply, and we very suddenly found ourselves on a bumpy, disused road, dwarfed on either side by towering oak trees. The daylight was fading, and I found myself gripped by unimaginable terror, completely unable to say anything, unable to process what I had seen. Simon, where are we going? Dad asked. Dad, I finally managed to croak. I want to go home. You are home, Kara, Simon finally replied. He brought the Ford Focus to a stop in the middle of a wooded clearing, far from civilization. Far from anything but a small lightless shack of a house. And then there was a clicking noise. What? My dad began. Get out of the car, Simon replied, pointing what I realized to be a handgun at my father. What the heck is this, my dad continued. I won't tell you again, Simon warned. And my dad shakily opened the door and stepped outside. Simon turned the gun onto me. His eyes were suddenly as untamed as his hair. You too, detective, he said. Get out. My dad opened the door for me and we embraced as Simon quickly got out of the driver's side, pointing the gun at both of us. Walk in front of me, he ordered. Head towards the front door and don't run. As we walked, I didn't dare look back at the lunatic. I huddled closely to my dad and prayed that the nightmare would end. We could barely see our feet in the pitch black forest, but we managed to stumble towards the front path of the shack. Open the door, John, Simon said. My dad lightly pushed the rickety wooden door and it opened onto a black chasm. Move, Simon growled. We can't see, my dad said. Something prodded me in the back and I turned slightly to see a torch in Simon's spare hand. He eyed me coldly until I took it. 
I was afraid to turn it on because part of me already knew what I would see. But it was worse. So much worse than the caravan. My dad yelled, but I didn't voice my terror. Of course, I was certainly just as horrified to be faced with rotten walls, mostly covered in brown hair, but it was exactly what I had expected. What I hadn't expected was the floors, stained a dark brownish or reddish color. I think I know what it must have been, but there was just so much of it, too much of it. I'll let you in on a secret, Simon gleefully whispered in my ear pointing at the walls. Underneath that soft, silky brown blanket, you'll find a sturdy underlayer of smooth, skin-covered plaster. I uttered an involuntary yelp. Simon giggled. Oh, don't worry, Kara. It decays, as do all beautiful things. We can always go downstairs for more. But don't you worry about downstairs. My dad and I embraced one another again. Head to the end of the corridor, Simon barked. What are you doing, Simon? My dad asked as we walked along the hair-walled, bloodied Florida hallway through an empty, derelict bungalow. Don't ask me, Simon replied, nodding at the door ahead. I shone the torch on the door handle and my dad obliged to Simon's request, twisting it. As the door lightly creaked open, I cast the light above my father's shoulder not daring to squeeze past him. I hid in fear. And my father's yelp told me that greater horrors lurked inside the following room. Dad, my father gasped. I stepped inside and knees quaking and found myself standing in a living room much like the one in Granddad's caravan. It was coated much like the corridor with interlaced hair blankets, every wall, floor, and furnishing. Everything but the fireplace which burned brightly enough for me to finally turn off the torch. And then there was the man himself, sitting atop a brown-haired throne with its back to the fire. My grandfather, the boogeyman. But he was barely a shadow. Eighty years old at the very least and he was an emaciated skeletal man. How could such a pale, weak thing strike so much fear in me? Sit, Grandad wheezed. Simon prodded the gun into each of our backs and he shut the door behind us. My father and I sat on the soft, hairy floor, and it took every ounce of my willpower not to projectile vomit again. My dad was crying. Why are you doing this to us, Dad? We're your family. Family, Grandad repeated thoughtfully. He was little more than a silhouette with the fireplace behind him, a dark outline, a faceless monster. And before Grandad could elaborate, Simon walked to the side of his master's throne. You really don't know who I am, do you, John? Simon laughed, prodding the gun aggressively in my direction. Why don't you tell her about her mother, how your wife got around easily? Simon laughed maniacally in the light of the crackling flames danced across his scruffy, patchy head of brunette hair. What are you talking about? Dad asked in a croaky whisper. What are you talking about? Simon mocked. You and Rachel, you were 16 and fell in love. It was the graduation prom. Your lady passed out and got knocked up. Dad had tears in his eyes and he turned to me. She was taken advantage of Kara. We didn't want you to know we wanted to spare you that story. It was long before you came along. My father weaved his fingers into mine, gripping my hand tightly. I managed to smile and nodded through my tears. This seemed to anger Simon. Look at me, Simon said, but Dad didn't. Look at me, you coward, the psychopath screamed, suddenly unloading a round into the wall. The deafening roar of the handgun petrified me. I shrieked, squeezing the life out of my father's hand. Dad quickly lifted his head to lock eyes with the crazed man standing before us. Tell her, Simon said calmly. Tell her who I am. Dad's eyes widened and he shook his head, finally having come to a realization. Yes, John, Simon said. It's me. 
the rotten thing that the two of you simply discarded at an orphanage. Thirty-four years ago, a helpless baby, abandoned by my mother and my... Simon paused, smiling slightly. Brother, Grandad finished. Silence filled the air as my grandfather's single word coursed through the room. The horror of the revelation struck me before my brain had even caught up. What do you mean? My dad whispered, though I knew that he had heard and understood, just as I had. He saved me, Simon said. Father saved me from the dump in which you left me. Father, my dad cried, shaking violently. She was perfect here, Rachel, Grandad coughed. Her hair, perfect. When your mother grew old, Rachel became the new key to my pure bloodline. Dad, face smeared with tears, started to wail, and I simply continued to tremble. This was far more terrible than anything I ever could have imagined. Don't cry, brother, Simon whispered. Your pain won't last long. You'll join the wall soon. Patience, son. The granddad croaked as loudly as he could muster. There is an order to these things. Sorry, father, Simon whimpered. The catalog. Granddad nodded lightly and his son, a brother to both my father and me, scurried out of the room in fear. The man on the vile throne then cast his gaze to me. With his back to the flames, I could barely see his face, but I caught a glimmer of something in the demon's eyes. Joy, perhaps, a demented form of joy. Kara, he muttered, there's another thing I have longed to tell you, something your father doesn't know. Come closer. Lip quivering, I crawled across the floor, releasing my father's hand, and stopped inches in front of my granddad's throne. The man unfurled one of his shaky fists, caressing my cheek with terrifyingly gnarled and inhuman fingers. He leaned forwards to whisper in my ear, and his following words will haunt me to the end of my days. You are Rachel's daughter, but you are also a child of my purest bloodline. He groaned. You will inherit my gift soon enough. I still want to pretend that I misinterpreted him, but I know that I didn't. I understood him perfectly. He was never my granddad. He was my father. I crawled backwards, horrified, and disbelieving eyes stretched wide. I crawled straight into my real father's warm, comforting arms. How did this monster do this to my mother twice? Sweets, I imagine, and now I fear what he might have been doing to me in my sleep over the years. Why did you kill her? My dad blubbered. Granddad sighed, though it was little more than a strained wheeze. All perfect things must be preserved in the catalog, otherwise they tarnish. Simon re-entered the room, and I turned to see that he was holding a Polaroid camera in his free hand. They're ready to be catalogued, Father, and Simon began. Everything happened quickly. My father, utilizing Simon's brief moment of distraction, sprang towards him. He propelled from the floor with such speed and force that, when he collided with the detective, the two of them hurtled through the open doorway into the main corridor, and my granddad, if I should even call him that anymore, howled like a wounded wolf supporting himself in the armrests of his throne and attempting to stand. I don't know what overcame me, but my body moved before my mind had even registered the situation. I lurched forwards and roughly thrusted my hands into my grandfather's bony and shriveled chest. He felt cold, even by the fire he felt cold. He and his throne of matted hair fell into the inferno, and he screeched at a piercing volume as the flames ensnared him. I stood in a frozen position witnessing a truly horrifying spectacle of burning hair, flesh, and whatever else formed the boogeyman, but it was all over far quicker than I expected. He was reduced to a charred mass concealed by flame. Father! I heard Simon splutter in pain. I turned to see my dad and knelt on the madman's chest, 
launching punch after punch into his bloody and bruised face. Kara, dead shouted, not taking his eyes off the monster that he was bludgeoning to death. Call the police. I quickly scooped my phone out of my pocket, dialed a 999 and the rest is a blur. My dad managed to stop just short of killing Simon. I had nightmares of the detective's corrupt fellow police officers bailing him out and arresting us instead. But they swiftly surrounded the house and apprehended Simon without a moment's hesitation. I hope he never sees the light of day, but perhaps we should have pushed him into the fire too. Is that my granddad speaking? Have I inherited his insane bloodlust as he promised? I think I eyed the fireplace in a trance for a good hour or so. Eventually, I managed to pull my gaze away and leave with my father, though there was nothing of granddad left at that point. I just had to be sure that I had burnt him to ashes. He spent so many years living in the shadows, an immortal specter that watched us night and day. I suppose I'll never truly believe that he's gone for good. After all, the boogeyman is dead but his bloodline lives. Eleven is a conniving number. Wedged between two round, robust integers, it sits on the fringe of all that is balanced. It sneaks and schemes. It lurks and loiters. I only learned of the number's limitless layers when I left a hotel room, numbered eleven at precisely three in the morning right on the hour, minute, and second. I believe that's how it works, but I only ever received fragmented answers. The eleventh door at the stroke of the third hour. That sentence was sloppily scrawled on the beige wall opposite my room. I looked at my wristwatch. Three o'clock. If the written message were a prank from another hotel guest, it would have been an eerily well-timed prank. How could anyone possibly have known that I would leave my room at that exact moment? I hadn't planned my exit. I was heading to the car because I had forgotten my phone charger. The eleventh door at the stroke of the third hour. The odds of those variables aligning are astronomically slim, but it happened to me so I have to assume it could happen to others. I may be the first victim of this paranormal phenomenon in human history but I hope to be the last. The hotel corridor was a liminal space, a threshold to a world that I still don't understand. It appeared ordinary on the surface, but something about the stark soundlessness of the hallway incessantly irked me. I realized that I was utterly alone. I had slipped into a foreign reality. I turned to my left. My stomach dropped as I squinted at the end of the hallway. Much to my dismay, I found that the hallway had no end. I turned to my right. Another wave of nausea. There was a ceaseless corridor in either direction. Twisting to face my hotel room, I was at least partly relieved to see that it looked exactly the same. Hoping to latch on to the remaining semblance of normalcy, I stepped back into number 11 and closed the door. I took a quick glance at my still sleeping family, and then I opened the door to the corridor again, praying for a different result. I internally despaired. The words were still there. The writings on the wall I mused, not oblivious to the foreboding connotations. The endless corridor had not contracted back to a finite length. I was still trapped in the dreadful alternate dimension. Are my wife and daughter trapped with me? I re-entered the room and watched the two of them lost in the land of dreams. They hadn't exited the eleventh door at the stroke of the third hour, so I hoped they were still in the real dimension. But that hypothesis didn't entirely convince me. Unwilling to explore the petrifying place between worlds, Having watched far too many horror films with heckless protagonists, I closed the door, undressed myself, and returned to bed. Adios, hallway, I thought, out of sight and out of mind. Maybe it's just a bad dream. 
I repeated that mantra tirelessly. Not so tirelessly that I couldn't eventually drift off to sleep, however. Evan, where's Malia? Sydney had asked. My wife jostled me awake and I turned to face every parent's worst nightmare. Malia's bed was empty. I looked at my wristwatch, 3 o'clock. Time was standing still. It's that boy she's seen, Sydney huffed. He's probably driven over here to pick her up. My foggy brain collected itself and I attempted to ascertain whether I had simply dreamt of the never-ending hotel corridor. Have you rung her? I asked. Sydney shook her head, her brow ferociously furrowing. I can't get any signal on my phone. I swear it's been three in the morning on the clock since I woke up. I gotta be losing it. Maybe I should just peek at the car park to see whether I can spot that boy and his barbaric bike. I inwardly smiled at the unintended alliteration, but I still hadn't registered Sydney's words. Perhaps something deep within my consciousness wouldn't allow me to face reality. Some truths are too overwhelming for mortal minds. And this is our last holiday before she goes to university, Evan. Sydney sighed, opening the curtains. I don't think she. My wife turned to stone. Slowly but surely, she unleashed an awful and ascending wail. Her entire body was trembling at the sight of the night sky before her. It wasn't until I sat upright in bed that I saw what she saw. It wasn't the night sky. It was a void. Eternal blackness. Evan, what's happening? Sydney whimpered. I slid from bed clumsily slithering into my gray t-shirt and faded denim jeans. I could feel the color draining from my face and I could also feel Sydney noticing that. I saw something, I said. I thought that I had been dreaming, but now, are we awake? Sydney pinched herself. This seems pretty real to me. What do you see? I gulped, gathering my words. At 3 o'clock, which feels like hours ago, I left the room to fetch my phone charger. I couldn't sleep and I was uh, just going to put on an audiobook or something. Anyway, I... well, maybe I should show you. I opened the door to the corridor and quivered at the writing that I had hoped I wouldn't see. My wife peered over my shoulder and gasped. Is, is somebody messing with us? She started. Look down the corridor, I interrupted. Just, it's gonna mess with your head. I could only watch helplessly as my wife stepped into the hallway, screamed and paced to and fro, clutching the sides of her head. Then suddenly her face fell still. No, it's a trick, it has to be, she asserted. They've set up mirrors and... But I couldn't see my reflection. Okay, screens, um, digital screens. How do you explain the nothingness outside? I asked quietly. Sydney stormed back into the room, picked up her slipper, and walked over to the window. I followed her back inside. She was presumably hoping to throw her slipper outside and rip the black canvas, revealing the hotel car park behind it. That didn't happen. What did happen was inexplicable. The window opened and the color drained from the room, not just the color but the light, the sound, and the matter. Swirling towards a plug hole, Sydney and I watched our bodies warp and stretch, much like everything else in room 11. We were being dragged into the black absence beyond the window. Shut it! I fearfully screamed. Sydney braced herself against the window frame in the wall, wrestling with the unseen agent of darkness that sought to claim us. Miraculously, she managed to slam the window shut. The room's color and physical matter returned to its rightful place, and elasticity. My wife and I collapsed onto the diamond-patterned orange carpet. I don't think it's a trick of the light, I breathlessly said. I felt that. I felt the blackness pulling me towards it. Sydney started crying, so I crawled over to her. She lay in my arms, sobbing while I rocked her back and forth. Where's Malia? She bawled. If our teenager daughter hadn't gone outside, that only meant one thing. She was somewhere within the never-ending hotel. My wife suddenly wrenched herself from my body and ran to the open door. 
I just remembered something. Come and look at this, she said. Sydney pointed at a spot on the carpet of the corridor. To the left of our room, there was a trail of crisp crumbs. Sydney's eagle eyes astounded me. Let's be thankful for her early hour snacking, Sydney said. I'm going to get dressed and then we can find our daughter. Sydney quickly donned her golden cardigan and ripped jeans, joining me in the corridor a minute later. My wife dumped a green coat on the hallway carpet, pointing out that it would be wise to leave a marker outside of our room. She looked at the words on the wall as we turned left and began our hunt. You think you opened a doorway to this place, she asked. I'm sorry, I said. No, I, I just want to figure out how we're going to open a doorway out of here, Sydney said. As we proceeded to follow the trail of crumbs down the beige hotel corridor, I found myself wondering the same thing. I also found myself slipping deeper into the terrifying throes of insanity. The never-ending corridor melted my mind. The doors were not numbered, and the environment was simply repeating itself forever. Eventually, of course, the crumbs stopped. We were blindly searching for Malia. When something new appeared on the horizon, Sydney seemed to have renewed energy and she quickened the pace. I sprinted after her and we slowly started to distinguish the shape of a vacuum cleaner in the corridor. There was a growing sound too. The vacuum was steadily buzzing away. Its squiggly cable disappeared into an ajar door on the left. A yellow post-it note clung to the vacuum cleaner. Enjoy your stay. How would you like to pay? Sydney read, shuddering. What does that mean? Before either of us could summon the bravery to push the door, it started to squeak open on its own accord. Our eyes followed the curvy trail of a vacuum cleaner's cord. There was a chambermaid kneeling on the floor, wriggling from side to side as she vacuumed. She was hidden around the side of the bed so that we could only see her legs and part of her torso. Where is Malia? Sydney firmly asked her. My wife had uttered the question before I had a chance to stop her. The chambermaid stopped moving and the vacuum cleaner switched off. The room plunged into silence. A horrifying sound, like a rusty tap handle twisting, emanated from the woman as she hoisted herself to her feet. Sydney and I screamed. The chambermaid had a body that was almost human, but some anatomical parts had been rendered incorrectly. She had four arms which all hung to the carpet, and her hair coated her entire head, seeping into the orifices on her face where her eyes and mouth should have been. My wife and I fled as the rusty squeaking noises of the creature pursued us down the long hotel corridor. We were putting distance between us and the chambermaid, who moved at a glacial pace, but our stamina was dwindling. Sydney eventually swung to her right, fumbling with the door handle, and we both slinked into a darkened room. She hurriedly closed the door behind us and we waited in the lightless space for the unearthly woman to either lose us or lose interest. Thankfully, we heard the chambermaid's abnormally quiet footsteps pitter-patter across the carpet past our room and disappear into the distance. And how wonderful it would have been for the horror to end there. But a telephone rang in the darkness. We paid more than a pound of flesh to escape the eternal corridors of that hotel. I'm not going to tell you twice. You know what you must never do. If the first part of my family's tale were insufficient to deter you from such an ill-advised endeavor, I think this closing post might suffice. Something really freaky is happening in this hotel, Nick, and I can't find my way out. This voice note should send when I finally get some phone signal. As soon as you hear it, please come and pick me up. The crackly voice on the other end of the telephone line unmistakably belonged to our daughter. Sydney screamed into the receiver until she realized that it was a voice recording. Fortunately, the message played on a loop. My wife listened to it five times before finally feeling content that she had heard every last word. 
Why did it make us listen to that? Sydney asked. I was illuminating her tear-stricken face with my phone light, given that the switches in the room were unresponsive. My wife stumbled towards me and I wrapped a comforting arm around her. Something's either toying with us or threatening us, I eventually replied. I don't think we were ever supposed to slip into this world. Well, I'm not going to hide here and find out. We need to find our daughter, Sydney said. I led the way to the exit with my phone light and gingerly opened the door to reveal an empty corridor. Well, it was empty as far as the eye could see, but danger lurked in that infinite passage. We had learned that. As we stepped outside, I caught the briefest flash of movement before a door slammed. What was that? Sydney screeched. It came from there, I replied, pointing at a door a few yards away. We hurried over and I shakily prepared myself for another room of terror. What I didn't expect to find was another hallway. This one different to the beige corridor that we had been traversing for the best part of an hour. It was tiled and lacked the garish fluorescent lights of the main hotel corridor. Instead, it was scarcely lit by endless rows of vending machines that lined either wall. The first few machines were empty, but Sydney and I stopped at the sight of a revolting red pool on the black diamond patterned tiles. Evan, Sydney cried. I didn't respond. I was looking at it too. The shelves of the vending machine were overflowing with bloodied slabs of meat. Human meat. Not just that, there was an assortment of severed limbs still donning blood-smeared flesh. I had a sickening thought that I might be looking at the remains of other victims that the endless hotel had claimed. Perhaps I hadn't been the first poor soul to step through the eleventh door into that world. Or perhaps there are simply other ways to enter that realm. Let's keep moving, I whispered, attempting to remain composed for Sydney. Careful on the wet tiles. As we continued to walk down the gloomy hallway, each vending machine told a terrifying tale of death and most likely suffering. And then there was the vending machine that prompted my wife and I to run. A decapitated human head lay on its side, and the eyelids sprang open, unleashing faded pupils that erratically eyed us. We ran until our lungs wheezed and then we kept running. I eventually noticed a change in the far distance. The limitless line of light seemed to have a limit after all. I could see an end to the vending machines, an end to the hallway, but there was no light beyond that point of finality. The thought of total darkness like the void from room 11's window haunted me more than the unearthly corridor or rows of vending machines. There would be no way to see what was lurking in there. The doorway led onto a hotel lobby which made no sense, given that we were on the third floor of the hotel. We're not really in a hotel, I reminded myself, and nothing here makes sense. The space wasn't as wholly dark as it had seemed from a distance. It was faintly lit by kerosene lamps on the walls, which burned relentlessly. Still, they did very little to reveal our surroundings. And while the floor area of the room was finite, unlike the corridors we had just traversed, the lobby walls climbed ceaselessly upwards. There was no visible ceiling, no staircase, and no other floors. We'll have to try those double doors, my wife said, nodding at the only exit from the darkened lobby. We don't even know whether Malia... A sinister sound interrupted Sydney's sentence. It came from the corridor of vending machines that we had just left. It was the sound of a window scraper. I don't know how else to describe it. Like everything else in that distorted dimension, it was menacingly mundane. A sound almost of our world, but not quite. We both turned to face the source of the sound. A slinking, spider-like creature with four razor-thin limbs was shooting towards us. A spectral bullet in a chamber, illuminated vaguely by the faint glow of the machines that passed. I could see it wore a purple suit on its inhuman body. It looked to be the concierge of the hotel. 
wailing wildly as Sydney and I ran for the doors at the far end of the lobby, barreling for the only escape route from the haunting thing that pursued us. My wife trembled as she threw open the doors revealing another dimly lit space. An endless space, of course, the hotel's kitchen. As we closed the double doors behind us, we caught one final glimpse of the spider-like monstrosity entering the lobby, scurrying towards us with its lengthy limbs of terror. I grabbed a nearby broom and threaded it through the handles, praying that it could withstand the impact of the concierge. But no thud came. We could hear the creature charging for the doors, but its footsteps suddenly stopped. Let's keep moving, I whispered to Sydney. More never-ending space. Mundanity breeds insanity. As we passed countless countertops, I started to wonder whether we would ever find our daughter or escape that endless realm. Evan, listen, Sydney said, gripping my arm. I heard it. A metallic banging noise accompanied by a girl's scream for help. It was Malia's voice but we couldn't know that with any modicum of certainty. Are we sure that's Malia? I asked, terrified of the dimensions, a treacherous trickery. My wife shot a fearsome glare in my direction. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. We kept running until we had reached the sound which was coming from a freezer door. Help! The voice cried. The door is stuck. Open it, Evan, Sydney pleaded. I drew a deep breath, bracing for whatever awful abomination might be waiting to pounce. Sydney stepped back while I heaved the stiff door open, heart beating against my chest. Malia! There, shivering on the floor, was my petrified, teary daughter. She looked up at me with a childlike vulnerability that I hadn't seen in years. Her tough teenage facade had fallen by the wayside. She embraced me and sobbed. What's happening, Dad? Where are we? I don't know, but let's get you out of here. Where's Mom? And now we reach the part of the story that I'm going to struggle to tell you, even after all these years. Ten years to be exact, but I'll try. It's time for me to finally let go. My wife wasn't behind me. She had vanished into the nothingness of the endless hotel without so much as a whimper. Before I had a chance to suggest searching for Malia's mother, a sudden sound horrified me. A window scraper. The creature had found its way inside the kitchen. I mean, of course it had. I don't know why I'd assumed it would obey the laws of physics. I clutched my daughter, unsure of which way to run, but a deafening ding answered the question for me. It was the sound of the elevator doors opening, a hundred yards or so to the left of us and a hundred yards to the right, crept an insidious insect in a purple suit. Run, I screamed at Malia. We hightailed to the open doors and I prayed that the doors would remain open. I didn't want to imagine what the spider creature would do if it were to catch us. When my daughter and I hurled ourselves into the left, I smashed the only button on offer and held my breath as the doors slowly drew together. The concierge stretched one of its terrible tentacle limbs towards the lift as the two doors met, but we were barricaded before it could tear into us. Neither my daughter nor I said a word as the lift moved. We could have been traveling left, right, up, or down. Nothing felt normal in that world. All I know is that I feared what we would find on the other side of the doors when they eventually opened. I certainly didn't expect to gaze upon the door to room 11 but that was exactly where the lift took us. How? Molly asked. I soundlessly ushered my daughter out of the lift, sobbing at the disappearance of my wife. As if to answer that thought, I heard a whisper behind me. I love you both. I turned hopefully, but that hope morphed into blood-curdling fear when I saw the reflection of my wife in the mirror of the hotel lift. She was a disembodied specter caged in a glass pane smiling at me with a white complexion and blood-stained clothing. The lights in the lift flickered and she was gone. Dad? Molly asked. The lift doors closed and I turned to face my daughter. She hadn't seen or heard her mother. Given the horrifying sight, I think I'm glad of that. Instead, she had been reading a post-it note on our door. 
what does it say? I asked. Payment accepted, Malia replied. We somberly entered the room and closed the door behind us. When I looked at my wristwatch, the second and minute hands were in motion again. Tentatively testing my hopeful hypothesis, I eased open the door. The corridor was a normal, finite length. No ominous message on the wall either. I heard a car honk outside as if to confirm that we had returned to reality and turned to see the night sky out of our hotel window. A harrowing but hopeful end to the most haunting experience of my life. It's been a decade and we've never been the same since. I am thankful for Malia's safety, but I can't stop thinking about Sydney's phantom in that lift mirror. I never had closure. Can something as finite as death occur in the infinite hotel?